yesterday. I think there were four. Four. Take your hand out. A total of four for an average of four and a half minutes each. Which isn't that good, but whatever. It's cool. Um, yeah, the idea is like, if you're gonna give a lecture, you might as well only give it once. Yeah. Great. So what am I doing? What happened over here? Here I'm in, here I'm in, here I'm in. Here I'm in, here I'm in. So now, and you have, are you gonna have like a copy of this meetup? It, yes, it's on you. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube. It's already on YouTube. Yep. Yes. So you have this one. So you're going to have two two versions of the same talk on YouTube now. Yeah. I probably delete the other one. Got it. Delete the one that doesn't go. Exactly. I made it slightly better, and I have a hand handouts now. I made those five minutes ago. Okay. Yeah. What is political geometry? Well, it's like using geometry to help you out with your politics. That's tough. Well, I think it's just pretty good fun. But, um, so we know about gerrymandering and districting. So each state elects people to the House of Representatives. Yeah. And um, the Constitution says that you have to set up a state into geographic regions, and each one elects a representative. Isn't the question is so there's no problem in Vermont because only one. So okay, it goes for one. But like Massachusetts has nine. So you have to set up Massachusetts with nine pieces. Yeah. And, and each part votes for one. So people, So is that person only campaign in that part of it? Yeah. So I get flyers in my mailbox from that person. Yeah. And so so they try to do things like make the region fifty two percent. Republican and forty-eight percent Democrat. Yeah. Or make it hundred and you know ninety percent Democrat, so that they just vote. Push all of it. Yeah. Push them all into one region. Or will Democrats do that too? Yeah, they do that too. Yeah. So that's what this is about. So this is always like a battleground, like each year between like what what what, what districts are we going to call districts? And like, just do the things they do with that. And stuff. Yeah. They don't really write them every year, but the, there's and the Constitution also says each one has to have equal population. So they do it after the census. Yeah. The census counts how many people there are and where they live. And so, you know, for instance, over time, people moved to cities. Yeah. And so if you left the regions where they were, then farmland, people would have a huge amount of power. Mm -hmm. The cities would have average power. So, so for instance, this is the nine congressional districts for Massachusetts. So you can see that they're really big up here, where it's like farmland. Really small in Boston, but they each have about seven hundred thousand. And how many, how many representatives are Democrats for Massachusetts? Most most of them. Nine out of nine. Nine out of nine. Yeah. So all the regions are Democrat. Yeah. Nine. And that's actually a really interesting thing. The thing about Massachusetts is about, it's about one third Republican and two thirds Democrat. So you think okay, they have nine representatives, which is should be six and three. But the problem is that Republicans like basically. Every town is two thirds Democrat and one third Republican. So there's just no way to create any kind of a district where Republicans are going to win in Boston. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. They like they uh, pace themselves out. But they all congregated around whatever, New Brunswick or New Bedford or something, then it's not the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that like the So these people, mathematicians actually proved recently that there's. Literally no way. Even if even if you were willing to take like little bits all around the state and make a virtual region, you couldn't get one with the Republican and Republican. Oh well, more you know. Good. I'll take this one by title and then I click. Oh yeah. Take care. Alright. Thank you. Hi guys. Hey, how are you? Yeah, what were you uh, I'm a rising sophomore. Okay. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Whoa, yeah. All right. You've almost run the gauntlet. Yeah. <laughs> wow.
She is a mathematician who's working on this a lot, and she'll come up in the talk. And uh, I've watched like 10 talks that she's given and read a lot of her work, and it's just the best. So instead of reinventing the wheel and making my own inferior slide, I decided to use hers. So, um, so I owe intellectual property to her. So districting is about what enumeration, apportionment, and then partition. So we in the United States, we have um, three parts of government, the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. We're going to talk about legislative today. And in the legislative branch, there's the Senate and the House of Representatives. The Senate is easy. There's just two per state. Fine. Um, elected. And then the, in, but in the House, there's different numbers depending on population. And so first you do enumeration and the census, the census um, counts how many people there are and where they live. And then based on that, you have we apportion a number of representatives per state depending on population. And that itself is an interesting math problem. Um, it's written up in detail in the Exeter Discrete Math um, materials. It has to do with geometric mean. Um, and then finally, we partition. So states are required to redistrict after each census. Each state gets a certain number of representatives. Say Massachusetts has nine, 
And then you have to take Massachusetts and break it up into nine geographic parts. Um, and each one has to have equal population. That's mandated by the Constitution. Um, so after each census, after people move around, you have to redraw the lines. If your number, yeah, you have to redraw the line. Oh, right. And the weird thing is that, oh, goodness, is that officials write the, do the lines for their own elections. So that is why the United States has this gerrymandering problem and other places don't. Um, other places have geographic districts and other places redraw the lines, but we're the only place where we redraw the lines really frequently and the people in power draw their own lines. That's why we have this problem. So here's an example of Massachusetts. As I said, it has nine districts. And you can see that in uh, densely populated areas, the districts are really small. And in lightly populated areas, the districts are really big. So there you go. Here's an example. All right. So why is it called gerrymandering, you might wonder? Well, um, it's named for Eldridge Jerry's salamander. So Eldridge Jerry was a senator from Massachusetts. and he redrew the lines in, and created this district. So this is north of Boston. Um, Boston's down here somewhere. And we are like around here in Exeter. Um, and so this political cartoonist said he was drawing this for his own uh, political gain and, and gave it sort of teeth and wings and stuff. Um, now this looks pretty tame. We've gotten a lot more uh, extreme with our gerrymandering more recently. So this is what it's named for. So here's some uh, districting principles. You might wonder, like, how are we allowed to draw the lines? Well, here are six, six, uh, six rules. Um, the, so equal population is mandated by the Constitution. That's the thing about the number. The Constitution says each region has to have the same number of people in each state. Um, and then each state has different rules. As you know, the United States, each one is allowed to set its own rules on various things. Like in New Hampshire, you don't have to wear a seatbelt, for example, unless you're a child. Um, and so each state has different rules. So a lot of states, though, have a rule that each district has to be reasonably compact. They don't define that notion, but they say it has to be the case. Um, and then contiguity. Most states have contiguity means that you have to be just a single piece. Um, most states have that. In fact, basically everyone does that, even if it's not in the books, because if you have multiple pieces, you uh, open yourself up to ridicule. So, uh, but it does get confused, a little bit complicated when there's water involved. Right. OK, so those are some sort of mathematical things. Here are some non-mathematical things. A lot of states say that you have to respect, if you can, county and city boundaries. Um, so when you come from a place where you do it, do you know what county you live in? You identify strongly with your county, right? Some places they do, and some places they don't, right? New Hampshire, I feel like, look up what, do you know what county you live in, y'all? Rochester. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, so out here, yeah, out here in the East, we don't really identify strongly with our county. Um, but in some places, like Texas, we do identify strongly with your county. So in those places, it's important to not break up counties and cities if you can. Um, so then there's also respect for communities of interest. A lot of states have this on the books that you, that you sh if you can avoid it, you shouldn't just cut right through some kind of demographic block. Um, so these middle four, so the first one is managed by the, uh, by the Constitution. These middle four vary by state. The last one is also a federal, is a federal thing that everyone has to comply with, the Voting Rights Act. And that says that um, basically you have to allow uh, minority groups to elect candidates of choice as possible. So each congressional district has roughly 700,000 people in it. So if you have a group of like 100,000 people that uh, are a member of some kind of racial minority, you don't have to do anything. But if there's a group of like 400,000, you are mandated by the Voting Rights Act to draw a district around them so that they can elect a candidate of choice. So the Voting Rights Act is one of the most powerful tools that people have to combat gerrymandering actually a law of the land. Um, there are other things you might want in your districting plan, like proportionality, right? If you have, we're talking about if you have one third, say, Republicans and two thirds Democrats, that's what's in Massachusetts, you might want to have one third uh, Republican representatives and two thirds Democrat, but that's not on the books. You might want your races to be competitive, not to have just an incumbent that keeps winning, that's not on the books. 
responsiveness, stability, none of these things are in any of the rules. So these, these ones are, are what we have to work with. Okay, so let's ignore geography for a minute and just imagine like an ideal mathematical easy version of the problem. So imagine that you have a state with six districts. We don't care where the people live. And you have two parties, the Green Party and the Gray Party. Well, here's one way you could do it. And this is something you can try with your activity there. Do you want an activity? Sure, I have an activity. In case you are bored, you can try your hand at doing that. Great. Um, so, so imagine this is six districts. Well, look what the Green Party has been able to do. They have gotten a little over 50% in these four districts, so they win. And then they put all the gray, they weren't able to win these two, of course, they didn't have enough people for that. So they put, they just said, okay, the gray, you can win those. That's pretty clever. There's names for this. Um, essentially, the green is making an efficient use of their voting. Um, and these strategies are called packing and cracking for your opponents. So this is called packing your, the gray people all into one, all into a couple of districts that they win by a lot and then cracking the rest of them so that there's a lot of them in each district, but not enough so that they can actually win. So these are strategies that go hand in hand, packing the ones that you know that you can't win and so that they win them by too much and then cracking them in other ones. So try your hand at packing and cracking if you like. So let's see how this plays out in real life um, because that's, that's not real life. So theoretically, you can get a seat share, meaning how many, how many districts you win, it's double your vote share. We can imagine that this is like 50% of the vote plus one vote, something like that. So you can almost double your vote share, your vote share and seat share. But how does it actually play out in real life? So here are some examples. This is Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, my state of residence. Anybody here from Pennsylvania? Okay, thank you. Um, and North Carolina, anybody here live in North Carolina? All right, great. So how does it work here? So in each of these, um, Democrats have about 50% of the vote. In Wisconsin, half the votes translated into 63 out of the 99 seats in the state legislature. This is not the federal, they don't have 99 representatives, but they were able to translate it into almost like two thirds. Pennsylvania, for congressional representatives, 50% of the vote got them, got Republicans 13 out of 18 seats. And in North Carolina, half the votes got 10 out of 13 seats. Well, you might wonder, why did they, how did they get 10 out of 13 seats? So one of the people that wrote the map said when they were drawing a map to elect 10 congressional Republicans and three Democrats, we did this because I do not believe it's possible to draw a map with 11 Republicans and two Democrats. So it's, it's not hidden. Nobody's, uh, yeah, not hidden. Um, and it's also not illegal. It's illegal to disenfranchise people based on race, but not based on political party. So um, the effect of this is the Republicans now have 32 out of the 50 legislatures, 32 out of the 50 governors and trifectas and 26 out of the 50 states, whereas Democrats only have it in three of those, eight of those states. So, so this is having a big impact on national politics. Okay, um, it wasn't always this way. And by the way, it's not only a Republican problem, uh, both parties gerrymander when they can. Okay, so let's talk about shapes because I identify as a geometer and I like to talk about shapes. So here's a, um, a terrible example of something that happened. So this is Tuskegee, Alabama, and this was a Supreme Court case in 1960. So the town of Tuskegee, Tuskegee drew its lines in 1957. So originally, the town of Tuskegee was a square. It's probably a mile square, right? That's what people do in a lot of places. And so, um, and afterward, it was this, really attractive 28-sided polygon. That's weird. Why would they do that? It looks like an ugly shape. Well, before it was 79% black. You can see that's a ski institute over here. That's a traditionally black uh, institute of higher education. And afterward, it was 100% white. So they just went and they excised all the, well, they just excised the white and said, this is Tuskegee. All of you are not in Tuskegee. And so you can imagine how elections went after that. Um, the issue, the issue. so this, this was a very clear cut Supreme Court case. Like it's very obvious what they were trying to do. They were trying to disenfranchise black voters. And so it was thrown out. Um, 
And that's one place where the Voting Rights Act was really powerful. Like that's what it's supposed to do. Um, for, by the way, the Voting Rights Act um, uses effect, not intent. So they could say, oh, we didn't know that was gonna happen. But it doesn't matter if you disenfranchise people, if that's the effect, then they throw it out. So that's good. Um, so this is pretty clear cut. The problem with congressional districts is that when you cut people out of one congressional district, you put them into another congressional district, right? So they still get to vote. So it's a little bit harder to figure out what's going on. So let's do a gallery of some interesting congressional districts. This is uh, Pennsylvania 7th. So I live here in Swarthmore. Yeah, you can call this the, we don't want you in our district, Diana, district. Um, it's also called Poofy Kicking Donald Duck. Can you see it? Poofy Kicking. <laughs> Right? Good. This is a this is a great one. So um, this, the city of Philadelphia is right here. It's a densely populated urban area, and it's cut into several pieces. <coughs> um, and it makes a narrowly Republican district, so it is cracking. Like there are many Democrats here, but not enough for a majority. And it's 80% white and neatly avoids the black neighborhoods over here. Um, but you can see it's a bizarre shape, and indeed it can be disconnected by the removal of a single building in two different places. Let's see it right there and there. So um, one of them is the Brandywine Hospital, and the other one is Creed Seafood and Steaks Restaurant. <laughs> a very, very important institutions for democracy. So that's why they, they hold the region together. Um, then there's Mar Maryland. Who's from Maryland? You are. You are. Yeah, you are. Um, so this is uh, also a bizarre looking district, um, opposed by, well, drawn by Democrats, opposed by everyone's, everyone, I guess, other than the Democrats, and it pushed out a 10-term Republican incumbent with an influx of Democrat minority voters. So this is what, cracking Republicans. So this is the other side. Um, and in when asked to explain what on earth is going on here, the Secretary of State said that they didn't mean for the district to look like that. That's just how the numbers worked out. We, we were really intent on balancing population. It's very complicated. You wouldn't understand And In order to uh, have a balanced population, all the districts, it just, it just worked out this way. Yep. Super convincing. Um, and then there's Illinois. So uh, I used to live in Evanston, which is right here. Um, and city of Sh downtown Chicago is right here. So this, this district is called the Earmuffs. Um, it has chunks of Pilsen, Pilsen, which is a Mexican-American neighborhood up here, and Humboldt Park, which is Puerto Rican down here, strung together by a highway. So this bit looks kind of fat in this picture, but it's actually just a strip along, I think, Route 90, something like that. Like, it's just a little strip along the highway where no one lives, and that holds these two together. So it's also almost disconnected. Um, this uh, Representative Luis Gutierrez won 13 straight elections there, and never less than 75% of the vote, often unopposed. So you might think, packing. But in fact, it was drawn by civil rights advocates to create a Latino opportunity district, um, fitting together with three majority black districts. So it was actually created as a region of opportunity with the Voting Rights Act, uh, or, or saying that if you have, um, you have to allow a minority group to elect a representative of choice. So it was created by Democrats, but it ended up sort of being unintentional packing. So it's accidental packing. Okay, and then there's North Carolina. Our friends from North Carolina. Good, yeah. So this one is super classic and notorious and has had lots of <laughs> lawsuits about it. Um, and the, they allege that like, it's a bizarre shape, so it should be thrown out. And lots and lots and lots of cases went to the Supreme Court saying, the shapes are weird, they're bad, so it's gerrymandering. And the Supreme Court justices basically said, we agree that it's gerrymandering, but this weird shape argument that you're using is not good enough. So we are, we cannot, we're not gonna make a ruling and throw it out. Um, they, they said, famously, they said, we're not gonna engage in endless beauty contests about shapes of districts. So um, this was created, so this one in particular 
was created after the 1990 census. Census happens every 10 years and billed as a voting rights district because it um, connects black populations in three cities, Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and Charlotte. Um, but essentially it's packing now because it's just putting them like all together. So, so in this case, race is used as a proxy um, because the Voting Rights Act allows you to use race, but race is strongly correlated with political party. So there you go. So originally it was a de Democratic gerrymander to try to get Democratic district and later Republican packing. So here's the thing. So the Supreme Court justices were actually right that you shouldn't have endless beauty contests um, about shape. So here's, this is the state of Pennsylvania. Again, um, uh, Philadelphia is here, and this is the border with Delaware, and Erie, Pennsylvania is up there. Um, so this is the notorious uh, goofy kicking Donald Duck. Can you see it there in blue? It's kind of hard to see, but it's there. And then the rest of the shapes of this districting plan are also kind of bizarre, like this sort of hammer-shaped one, right, and this sort of earmuff-shaped one. So you could say, yeah, that, that has bizarre shapes. We don't like it, let's throw it out. Okay, but let's look at these other three plans. Uh, uh, what do you think about the shapes? Bizarre. Bizarre? Are there any ones that aren't bizarre? Like which one's the best? I like the bottom right. You like the bottom right, okay. Yeah. yeah. We can't really tell what's going on in Philadelphia. Yeah, the colors are not so hot. I didn't make this picture. But there, it's kind of the weird color scheme. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Yeah, I mean, the idea here is Will is right that this is turns out to be the sort of most fair of the maps, but I don't think it's obvious. Nice job, well done. Um, but I don't think it's obvious. There's no, they're all kind of chunky. They don't look obviously good or obviously bad necessarily. So it's kind of hard to tell just by looking at the shapes which one is an extreme gerrymander and which one aren't. So we have to do something else. Maybe math, good idea. So the, um, the tool that's been used recently to great success is random walks. So I mentioned that, so none of those court cases that went to the Supreme Court about shape won. So it was like, you know, zero for 80 or something in terms of court cases won, like we're at zero. But random walks is hopefully gonna work out. So here's what a random walk is. So suppose you are on the number line, you start somewhere, and then you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you go right, and if it's tails, you go to the left. You do this over and over again. So you might start there, and then random walk, and then wander around, and then, okay, so after a long time of doing this, flip coin flipping, where do you end up? Great question. What? Back where you started. Yeah, back where you started. Usually back where you started. So I, I, I taught discrete math. I had this in there. I had a bunch of computer science students in there. So I had them do this. So this is um, 100,000 trials of doing a 10 step random walk. So you flip a coin 10 times, you figure out where you land, and then you do it again, and you do it again. And so about a quarter of the time, you end up back at zero, and the other, and very, very infrequently, you end up actually just going all the way to the right every time, or all the way to the left. Um, what about if you walk for longer? So this is if you do a 100 step random walk. And then this is 100,000 trials of it. So as you can see, usually you end up somewhere in the middle, let's say between negative 40 and 40. And it's pretty unlikely that you'll end up out here like at 80. Pretty unlikely. It could happen, but it's unlikely. Um, there's no reason why we should constrain ourselves to the number line. After all, I'm not even wandering back and forth here on the number line. I'm using two-dimensional space. So you can do the same thing in the plane. You flip your four-sided coin, and you decide whether to go north, south, east, or west, and you wander around. And there's no reason why we could only wander on a plane. You could wander on anything. This probably isn't the best example, but this is what I decided on. You start at a vertex of a dodecahedron, and you flip a three-sided coin, and decide whether to go here, here, or here, and then you, wherever you end up, you you flip a three-sided coin and decide to go here or here, and you just wander around the deck of see where you end up. I don't know. Why not? You could wander around anything, just as long as you have a random way to decide. So let's wander around on districting plans. Great idea, right? Okay, so um, this is a map of the United States with the 
congressional districts. So you can see uh, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota only have one representative, so they don't have to worry about districting. Same with Alaska and Vermont. Uh, New Hampshire here has two, Maine has two, and so on. So let's walk around on districting plans. So here's the hard problem that the Supreme Court, you know, the court cases, they weren't able to decide whether something was fair. So we want to decide whether our districting plan is fair. Great, great question. So suppose you have, here's a seven by seven grid on your activity, you have a six by seven grid, but you want to cut, in this case, the seven by seven grid into seven connected districts of equal size. And we want to say like, which ones are fair or whatever. Well, uh, there's a lots of ways to do that. What, 158 million ways to do that. That's a lot. Um, if it were a nine by nine grid, there's this number. This is a really big number of ways to do it. Um, and for 10 by 10, um, it ran on a supercomputer for over a month, and I'm not sure of the outcome, but it would certainly be a very big number. Well, it's a definitely, this is like a toy, toy version of the problem, and it's already uh, intractable by just enumerating all possible things. So, so instead of counting all the possibilities and then like assessing our plan among all the actual possibilities, what we can do is random walk. So here's a division of the seven by seven grid into seven regions of seven blocks each. And we're gonna random walk around it. And what we're gonna do is at each time step, um, we're going to pick two uh, neighboring districts and flip their allegiance. And if that flip, if it was like this flip and it would make something disconnected, then we'll run it and not do it. So here's a, an example. So we're just, instead of doing a coin flip and going left or right on the, on the number line, we're just doing a coin flip and flipping the allegiance of neighboring districts. So this is a way to wander around district plans and get some idea of the possibilities. Um, this is a toy example. Um, we can, so here's an example of actual Iowa. So Iowa has 99 counties and they have a rule that it's four congressional districts each have to be made up of a union of counties. So if we want to wander around on the space of districting plans in Iowa, we can just represent each county by a node or a dot and connect them by lines and then flip them. So this is wandering around on the possible, all the possible districting plans in Iowa. So it randomly explores the space, um, even though the space is so, so big. And so we can explore until we've seen billions or trillions of plans whenever, whenever we want to stop. So this is a nice way to explore the space without enumerating like every possibility in the space. Good idea. Um, the possibility space is way too large to actually do it. You might wonder, well, why don't we actually just try all the options? So in Pennsylvania, there are nine in 18 districts and they each have to be made up of a union of voting precincts. So I said in Iowa, uh, each one has to be a union of counties. So that problem isn't very big, but in Pennsylvania, there's these much smaller pieces. And so can you imagine if you took 9,059 voting precincts and you wanted to separate them into 18 pieces, how long would that take? Well, a really long time. Um, at one microsecond per districting plan, this would take until the heat death of the universe. So um, I don't have that kind of time. Every moment of my life is precious. And so I'd like to run a walk. So let's do it. So here's Pennsylvania. Here's the original districting plan. This, is, this was enacted in 2011 after the 2010 census. And this is the one with Goofy kicking Donald Duck and everything else. So that was thrown out by the state Supreme Court. Not, the, not what we usually think of as a Supreme Court, which is the National Supreme Court, Federal Supreme Court. This was the state Supreme Court. You didn't even have to go to the federal. The state was like, okay, you're right, it's bad. So they were like, fine, we'll, re we'll redraw it. So the le legislature proposed this revision. Uh, it was a Republican controlled legislature. And the governor was like, mm, no, I don't like your plan. And so the governor proposed a plan, the Democratic governor, uh, Tom Wolf. And it turns out, we'll look at, we'll, so we'll look at the uh, random walk data on these three. And it turns out that, that they're bad. And so they had to bring in a special master, what's called a special master, that's a technical term, um, an outside person to draw a map. And this is the remedial plan, like put them in remedial 
put your students in remedial algebra, they put a remedial districting plan, which was enacted in 2018. And this is what was used for the 2018 midterm elections. So let's look at, let's look at, let's look at them. So uh, to just give an idea, we'll walk through orange pink land instead of blue red land. So this is a 10 by 10 grid where orange voters have 40%. So this is very much like the activity that you have, except I made yours smaller so that it was more tractable for you to actually do. So 40% so are orange voters. So if we make 10 districts, how many should orange win? Four, four would be good, four orange, six pink. That would be proportional. And I put that as the first task on the sheet, try to do proportional representation. So here's a just an intuitive way of, of dividing this into 10 districts, just make rectangles. So this gives us two safe orange seats. That means one where orange has more than half and one toss up, meaning one where it's five and five. It's this one. So basically orange has two and a half seats here. If we just do the same thing, but in the other way, there are no safe orange seats and three, three ties. So we'd say orange gets like on average 1.5. On the other hand, here's the proportional representation that with four safe orange seats, four safe pink seats. So this is a proportional plan. It's looking a little, a little weird, not that weird. And then here we can get six safe orange seats. Check it out. So we've turned 40% vote share into 60% seat share here. Okay, so let's see what this random walk thing has to say about these plans. So uh, Moon had a computer do runs of 100,000 random walks on a districting plan. So the question is how many orange seats did they get? So uh, we're random walking around the space of districting plans, on a, not on a supercomputer, but on a laptop. So this is a very light computational thing that will not take until the heat death of the universe. You can just get it to go. So, so we, anytime you random walk, you have to start somewhere. We talked about random walking on the number line starting at the origin. In this case of the districting plans, we'll start with the districting plan that you want to analyze, because that makes it more likely that the things you get to will be more similar to the one you start with, which is, if anything, uh, biasing toward the one that you start with. So let's start with plan B. So um, plan B, as you will recall, had on average one and a half orange seats. If we do a run and see how many orange seats other nearby plans get, well, this is the first run. Second run and third run. So this is maybe not in the, it's not in the fat part of the distribution, but it's certainly within reasonable range, seems like. How about this one? We start with this plan, we random walk. This one has six seats for orange. When you start here and you random walk, here's the first run, second run, third run. Uh, so even though, can move if you want. Um, even though we started here, it very quickly went to this. Um, it basically ended up in the same distribution as before. So this illustrates the idea that when you do this random walk, it doesn't really matter where you start. It still gets a whatever representative sample of the districting plan it is, because these runs look really quite similar. So this is this is maybe convincing evidence that six is outside of reasonable. But reasonable expectation. So that's the idea. All right, how about real life? So um, Tom Wolf brought in a mathematician, which was Moon, to uh, analyze the districting plan by the Republican legislature and legislature and his own plan. So this is what she did. So let's talk about it. What's the analysis on Pennsylvania? So the, here are the 9,059 precincts of Pennsylvania. This Division is nonpartisan. These are what's called census blocks. Each one has about 4,000 people. They're just, they're, they're, yeah, they're what um, census districts have to be. Uh, they are what congressional districts have to be unions of, but this one is not partisan. So as you can see in Philadelphia, they're very small. You can't really see what's going on. Um, and up here in farm country, they're quite big. Okay, so those are the precincts. And if you lay a plan on top, well, this is the plan you'd start with when we ran a walk. And then we just explore the space of possible plans. So what happens next? So now we make 
lots of random slips. So this is two to the 30th power. How big is that? That's like two to the 10th is like a thousand. So that's a thousand, 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 which is a billion. So we do a billion, we wander around and so, so we've seen a billion plants. Okay. But here's a question. So on the x-axis of the other one, I had seats. Number of seats won by each party, the pink party and the orange party, or rather just the orange party. But you can't really do that for this. Because bizarre as it may seem, there's no such thing as a Democrat or a Republican. You can't say the Democrats are here, the Republicans are there. Because it's people who actually vote different ways in different elections. So for example, in 2016, the presidential election on the same ballot for Pennsylvania, there was election for president, Clinton versus Trump, and there was a congressional election. And the vote share for Democrats and Republicans is about the same for both, but the distribution was super different. There were a lot of people who voted Democrat in one election and Republican in the other election on the same ballot. So we can't put number of seats won on the axis because we don't really know how people are going to vote. So um, what we have to use is some other metric, a measurement. So what, here are some, here are what people were using before they did random walks. Okay, here are two scores. So this, there's the mean median score, which measures how far short of half the votes you can get while still having half of the representation. So for example, if you could have 40% vote share and get 50% of the seats, um, then your mean median score would be 0.1. 10%. Uh, and then, so there's that. That's a good one, right? It's like, it's gerrymandered if you can get half the representation without having half the votes. And another one is efficiency gap, which measures basically wasted votes. So when you pack your opponent into a region, they waste a lot of votes. When you crack them and don't, don't let them vote, get uh, seats for their votes, that wastes a lot of votes. And you just measure the difference between who, who who's wasting more votes. So these were, before the random walk approach, this is what people use. They just said, oh, Democrats are wasting more votes, so it's a Democratic gerrymander. Or they said, oh, um, Democrats can fall short of half of the votes and still get half the representation, so it's a Democratic gerrymander, whatever. So these were measures that people were already using. Great, so that's what's gonna be on the axis. Okay, so over here, we're using the mean median score, how short you can fall of 50% while still getting 50% of the seats. And over here, we're using efficiency gap, which is about wasted votes. And we're going to assess um, the le Republican legislature's plan, the um, goofy kicking Donald Duck plan, and the go re Democratic governor's plan. So, anyway, you see the picture. Let's talk about this one. We started with the, well, let's start with this one, the current plan, the one that was enacted and that people actually voted with. So you start. On this axis, who cares what the numbers mean, but it's more favoring for the Republican on the right. So if you start with the goofy kicking Donald Duck plan and you random walk, well, you get this distribution of plans that are all similar to goofy kicking Donald Duck, but they all are much more balanced. Here's zero um, than this one. It does show you that this whole distribution basically is Republican favoring because zero is over here, but this one is way more Republican favoring. Um, and then the remedial plan suggested by the legislature, the, um, the regions were more nice and less goofy kicking down the duckish. But when you start with this one and random walk, still you get this whole distribution over here and this is a way outlier. On the other hand, the governor, Tom Wolf, his plan, you start with his plan and then, then this is the distribution that you get. So funnily enough, it's actually on the Republican favoring side of the distribution even, and zero is over here. If you wanted a Democratic favoring, it would be over there. Um, but it's in the fat part of the distribution, so reasonable. Um, and the same kind of things happen with the other metrics. They, these end up outside to the right side of the distribution and the governor's one ends up in there. So this was the uh, uh, reasoning that Moon used to tell the governor to that these plans that this uh, remedial plan was still biased, even though it looked good on paper. Um, so if you want to bring this stuff into your class, you can go to my website, you can just search for me online and click on teaching, and then 
have this discrete math curriculum, which is, I took Exeter's discrete math curriculum and added a bunch of gerrymandering to it. So for instance, here's a page of it. I have problems that um, have, like, have students discover this. We're gonna walk stuff. Here's Pennsylvania, and here's a baby districting plan uh, explaining the flipping of districts and walking around the districting plans. Um, it's a super rich area. It has lots of math in it. Um, if you are doing this kind of math and you want to use gerrymandering examples for your students, they, it's great. It's in the news. Census is coming up in 2020, so it's a good time to have an educated population. Um, so in particular, we're having a gerrymandering for educators day at Tufts University. So if you're local and you want to come, please come. Um, email me. We, and the other thing is we haven't figured out what we're doing on that day. So if there's if you want to come and there's something you want to, to learn on that day, like tell me. And we'll put it in. Um, if you want to use exact existing materials, great. Like take them, use them. Um, if you create your own, please send them back. We want to make a, a database or just a big bucket of stuff that people can use. Um, and also, if you want to read about this stuff, the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group they just keep putting out white papers on really interesting things. Um, so they they did an analysis of Massachusetts, proving that it's mathematically impossible for Republicans to ever get representation there at all. It's going to be nine out of nine Democrats forever. Uh, there's no way, to, or unless, unless Republicans move in. They did a thing about um, Chicago uh, city elections. They did a thing about Santa Clara, California elections. So if you're interested in voting theory, anyway, it's not math papers. It's like they're easy to read and wonderful. So you can go there too. All right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you for the presentation. I taught, I taught this in my discrete math class, so I'm glad I'm finally starting to understand it now. I'm coming here. So um, I still am foggy on how the random walk works. Okay. So um, could, you, could you go through that again? Can you, can I understand you what more? random walk is, but the yes. random walk with uh, the flipping and what is it you're actually plotting on those maps? You do those histograms and so forth. This? No, go back. So yeah, go. Yeah, like what do you, what do you what do you do with the red walk? So you we had um there some of these blocks are pink and some of them are yellow, right? Or orange. And we uh, I'll do this one because it's, I can actually touch it. So at each time step, you decide what you pick, like some neighboring blocks, and you and you flip them. And, and then, then you, the next time step, what do you do? You pick other neighboring blocks and you flip them. And is it random which ones you pick? Yes. Okay. And then you count each time. You count how many regions were won by the orange party and how many were won by the pink, and then you add one to your histogram. So with that Pennsylvania map. That graph. Yeah. You you have all the nodes and all the edges. So yes. what are you flipping there? The pencil. Uh, this. What do you flip? So it's the same thing, except instead of a hundred pieces, we have nine thousand fifty-nine. So if there's some districts, and this one is in district one, and this one is in district two, we might flip. The allegiance of these two little pieces, and then we redo our statistic, and then the next time step, flip the allegiance of these two and redo our statistic, and the next time step, flip the allegiance of these two and redo our so statistic. Do you know which allegiance they have? Yeah, you start with the um, you start with upland that gives every region an allegiance, and then you pick two on the border and flip them, and if it becomes disconnected, then you throw it away and do something else. But if it doesn't, then you just keep going. And are all the same little things that you're flipping, do they have the same population? Yeah. They, okay. they, well, they have roughly the same population. Roughly. So when you do it, you, you can't insist, it's a good question, because you can't insist that each of your plans has exactly the right population, mm -hmm. because they never will. But you give yourself a kind of a buffer. You allow yourself to go between, say, 99 and 101% of what you want, or maybe maybe within 2% of what you want. Um, in the end, if you get a, a districting plan where all the populations are within 2% of what you want, 
you can always fix it and make it. Yeah. yeah. So you allow yourself some leeway when you're wandering around. Um, technically, you're wandering around in the graph of districting plans where two districting plans are connected by an edge if you can get from one to the other by flipping two districts. So they call it a metagraph. So the districting self plan itself is kind of a graph. And this is a metagraph where it's like in unimaginably big and interconnected. But you know, we have with a little three by three region, we have to make the graph of the districting plan. Yeah, I mean, that was what struck me. And, and maybe the most interesting thing is kind of a new appreciation for a useful random walks. Is I think random walks are really interesting, but as a mechanism for reducing some impossible number of cases to some whatever number you can pull off in a random way, I thought that was pretty astonishing. Right. And the nice thing is that there's a lot of math. So there's this subject called ergodic theory about mixing, ergodic being like mixing. And they've, they've studied the lots of theorems about how much you have to mix, stir things in order for them to be well mixed. So you can imagine if you start like with white bread and pumpernickel bread, how long do you have to knead it before it's well mixed? There's theorems for that. And so the same thing here, if you just random walk for a hundred steps, you're not gonna get a good sample. But we have theorems that'll tell you how long you have to go to have a good sense of whether you're mixed. Because yeah, I find myself always, when I run into some problem that has a gazillion cases or whatever, and you're trying to sort of go at it hammer and tongs, I'm just kind of like, oh my God, what do you do? Yeah. And so this is like, wow. Oh, what an interesting yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on the histogram slide, I think it's the next one. Um, I was wondering on the right, why they were um, sort of spiky. I know. I don't know either. Okay. Sorry. I just thought that was like. Isn't that really weird? What's going on? Uh, what is that? That's efficiency gap. Yeah, I'm actually not sure. I wonder okay. that too. Look it up. Read the paper. They're I, they're super readable, and I um I should have probably credited them. But it must be if there's some kind of what do you think something jumps at some point. Good question. Try to skip over that. But you were paying attention. <laughs> so yeah. So if you uh, want to come, let me know. If you want to be, I don't know, uh, not come, but still be involved. Can you go back to the one you were just on? So the three plans, if you again, what what was the conclusion? The conclusion the mean, mean. was that the um, 2011 plan that people actually voted under was gerrymandered for Republicans. That the remedial plan suggested by the Republican legislature was gerrymandered for Republicans. And that the plan suggested by the governor was did not favor one party over the other. It was not gerrymandered. But then they enacted a fourth plan. But then they enacted a fourth plan. Yeah. I think probably because the legislature wasn't going to agree to this. It was a Republican controlled legislature and they weren't going to just uh, okay. out of their own, they weren't going to voluntarily agree to this plan. Because there's analysis like that. I think there probably was. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the four, I, read, I, I haven't seen an analysis of the fourth plan, but I did read an article about it, and I think it was seen as pretty. Uh, it was seen as pretty pretty good. But one of the things it didn't do was these people. All the people who made these plans live in the state of Pennsylvania, so they have some idea of the communities of interest. In and even though it's not in the books, they kept, they thought about the communities of interest when they drew the maps. And the um, special master was coming in from California and wasn't aware of the communities of interest and they weren't, that isn't in the laws that you have to respect communities of interest. And so that map actually didn't really respect communities of interest in the same way. So that's what you get when you bring someone in from outside. At least that's what the article. So the governor's plan respected communities of interest. And in doing that, was slightly favoring. They all respect the communities of interest. You can right. respect, I mean, communities of interest are small. You can. But of all those ones, the governor's plan was the 
extreme. That's right. Where the other two were so extreme. That's right. And you said the governor was Democrat? Yeah. Yeah, right. Massachusetts often has a Republican governor with the Democratic state. It's a Republican state. All right, thank you. Feel free to take more things for your friends. I've seen enough.